if you're starting to learn chess, as Ian said, um, first thing you probably need to do is, is know a bit about the rules. And, and again, the same with CRC. CRC's got a, a set of rules that we're all going to have to abide by and understand. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through some of those rules. Now, I'm not going to be stood here saying 6.2.3 subclause A means this. I think that would put us all to sleep very quickly. I'm going to give you an overview of, of what the rules mean to you, and probably most importantly, how they impact your organisation, both from an administration point of view and from a financial point of view. So that's my challenge. CRC is a piece of legislation that has a goal. And that goal is to get you to focus and ultimately reduce your carbon emissions. Now, it's not the first piece of legislation that's, that, that's taken that route. And, and as you can see on the screen behind me, there's many, many other pieces of legislation. And there'll be many more to come. And the reason is that top line. The government has given, on our behalf, on your behalf, a binding commitment to reduce our emissions by 80% by 2050. So what is it? Well, very simply, it is a scheme that sits in four phases. What they're asking you to do is to purchase forward allowances to cover your carbon emissions. So to predict what your emissions are going to be and then buy those allowances. They then want you to monitor over a period what your allowances actually were and then, if you'd measured right in the first place, they want you to surrender those allowances to cover your actual emissions. And there'll be a bit of balancing. You might have bought a few more, you might have bought a few less. Now, normally, with most pieces of legislation, it involves a tax where you pay money, you don't get anything back. But CRC is slightly different in that there's actually a recycling payment. So all that money is put into the pot, and they anticipate that somewhere to be around £753 million. Pounds all that money is going to be recycled back to the participants. So how do you know whether you're captured by CRC or not? Well, they've made it relatively straightforward. If you used, used, and I say that in past tense, used 6,000 megawatt hours or 6 gig of mandatory half-hourly metered electricity during the period January to December 2008, you will be captured as a CRC organisation as a full participant. If you use less than that, there are certain bandings that you have to do certain things, but you're not captured by having to buy the allowances. Now, there are now it's also <coughs> worth knowing different types of organisations and they're, they're captured, because you might say, well, if, if, if you own the building you're in and, and you're responsible for everything and you manage it and you pay the bill, etc., then, then you're definitely uh, party captured by that if you, if you go use the qualifying consumption. What happens if you're a landlord? How, you know, how other people are in the building, I can't control the energy used. Well, if you were the counterparty to the electricity contract, you physically sign it in your organisation's name, it doesn't matter. You are still the CR responsible as a CRC organisation. I also mentioned an evidence pack, and, and an evidence pack is for the Environment Agency and the other organisations that are going to administer this scheme to know that you're doing the, the right thing and that you're not trying to cheat the system. You're not making it up. What they want from you, structural records, a list of all your sites and the types of sites. Data records, how much energy they've used, gas, electricity, all fossil fuels. It's not just electricity, gas, electricity, LPG, coal, oil. Any fossil fuel has to be recorded. A special events record. Now this is quite interesting, this could be quite onerous. If you have a fundamental change in your energy use in your organisation, you need to be able to record it. And you need to do this in a special events diary. The example that's given is a change of metre. If you had a metre exchange and the auditor came to see you and he was looking at the metre readings and suddenly those metre readings were non-concurrent, they could say, hang on a bit, you're fiddling the numbers, you just changed those metre readings to make it look like you've used less energy. And you say, honest, no, we didn't, we didn't. It was actually a metre exchange. That was the last metre read. This was the new meter read, that was the date, this is the certificate of the meter, that was the old type of meter, this is the new meter, this is the picture. I've now evidenced that it was a genuine change. So I can actually evidence that even though my meter readings weren't concurrent, there was a reason for that. 
Would you normally keep that in a, in a diary then? Possibly not. It's probably more of an inconvenience. You have to record every single event that could mean that your energy could change. So you can evidence it should you be audited. That might be changes in working hours. It might be the installation of new plants. It could be a whole host of things. Anything that causes a fundamental change in energy, you need to evidence and record in your special events record. There are so many opportunities to get fined. It's great. You've got lots and lots of opportunities, so don't worry about that. The fines, mainly are monetary. For the first one, for, for not complying and missing dates and things, obviously these are civil penalties, and they will charge you for basically any carbon that you should have bought as a penalty, plus you've got to buy the carbon as well. So, so this starts adding up when you start imposing the fine. And the later you leave it, the more it will cost you. So it's not, oh, we didn't do it, we've got a bit of time now till we get caught again. Every single day, that charge is going to increase. But it gets more interesting. Because not only are there civil penalties, there are criminal penalties as well.